Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Francine Lacqua. I work for Bloomberg TV, and I'm very excited of doing this panel today with you. So we're going to have a panel discussion for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open questions to the floor. If you have a question, please just raise your hand. I'll come to you. When you ask a question, um, if you tell us your name and where, where you work, and also you have to press that little button on the microphones, otherwise we won't be able to hear you. So today we'll, we'll be discussing, of course, the real estate market with patchy economic conditions in the Western world. Real estate is segmenting into the recovery have and have not. So I'd like to welcome our panelists. First of all, we have Fiona De Silva, Managing Director at Kennedy Wilson Europe. David Evans, Chair, London Office, Goodwin Proctor. Jonathan Goldstein, Deputy Chief Executive at Heron International, and Anthony Myers, the Senior Managing Director, Real Estate Group at Blackstone. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining us, and I hope it's going to be an exciting and, and fun conversation. Before we get down to business, I was very excited that Jonathan were on the panel, was on the panel because, of course, they've been in the news, and we're at Heron Tower, so he can't avoid the question. First of all, Jonathan, before we get into the nitty-gritty of the real estate market, there have been a lot of reports in the press about Heron that owns this gorgeous tower having to sell the building to pay back debt. Give us the scoop. Well, there's uh, nothing like being jumped into a conversation, is there? So, uh, um, well, clearly it's been unusual for a private company to have its uh, refinancing negotiations played out like a soap opera in the press, as we have done in the last few weeks. And uh, maybe it's an example of the fact that nothing is private within the uh, property business. The greatest example of that was actually my wife had an operation in, in May and I was sitting in the hospital and I received a draft term sheet from a bank and only I received it from the bank and therefore I was surprised a half an hour later to receive a phone call from the Times to say, I understand you received a term sheet from a certain institution. So th this is the way it's played out over the last few months, predominantly because of the, 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 uh, the, the profile of the asset and uh, the profile of the characters uh, uh, who have uh, forged strong property careers. I mean, I'm pleased to say that we've concluded a refinancing. That's the most important thing. Um, it's been an unusual and not necessarily straightforward process. Uh, it's a reflection of the changes in the, glo in the uh, environment and the uh, economy uh, from a, uh, a construction project that started back in 2006. But fundamentally, and I think what we'll talk about over the course of the next hour, I would guess, is that where the strength in, in real estate has been in the last few years has been within the capital cities and has been in quality assets in the capital cities. And what you're sitting in, we believe, is one of the great um, quality assets. It has uh, strong backers, strong backers with strong views, not just Heron, but its partners as well. And sometimes uh, strong views take some time to work through and to, to come to an accord. But I'm pleased to say that we have reached that accord uh, we have refinanced with, uh, as, uh, as headline, with Starwood, uh, with a uh, senior debt facility, who were the most competitive amongst uh, an improving debt market where we received a, a number of offers during the second quarter of this year. Our existing partnership remains as it was beforehand. We have the same partners that we had as beforehand in exactly the same percentages as beforehand, notwithstanding anything you might read anywhere else. And fundamentally, as I say, that's because I think it's a quality asset and people believe in the long-term viability of quality assets. Starting a panel with a bit of breaking news never hurt anyone. Thank <laughs> you so much for that. Jonathan, um, Anthony, let me ask you just f first of all to give us an overview of the different markets. If you look at US compared to Europe to the rest of the world, w you know, are we in a bubble and where? Well, I think if you start with the US, um, we like to look at it from the sort of baseball analogy, which I apologize for in this environment. But for us, the US is probably somewhere in the sort of fifth and sixth inning of a nine inning game. Um, for us, we really started getting active uh, uh, investing post the crisis in the middle part of 2009. And from really 2009 till probably the end of 2011 was really the trough in the cycle there. Uh, the US, uh, in a little different way in format to to Europe was a little bit more proactive, certainly within the banking system, in terms of taking the right steps to clean out their toxic assets. And for those two years, certainly there were uh, really attractive opportunities. You're starting to already see today that the US has started to heal. The banking system is back to profitability. And because you've got basic growth in the economy in the US, somewhere between two, two and a half percent, you're starting to see asset values you know, inflate 
In markets such as Manhattan, you probably have values that are close to where they were in 2007 already. Uh, and in certain areas, I would say, you know, we are more of a seller um, than a buyer in some of those markets. There still is a need for recapitalization in certain circumstances in the U.S., but it's different to where we see ourselves in, in Europe. Um, by contrast, while we were very active in the U.S. towards the middle of 2009, uh, we made no investments in Europe in 2008. We made one investment in 2009, nothing again in 2010. And, and to a large extent, the banking system in Europe here was, was really frozen. Uh, some would say it was part denial, but the reality is it's just not as well a functioning system for all the reasons that everybody knows. Uh, and unlike the U.S., it sat to a large extent uh, with the loans on the, on, the, on the books. It was only really in 2011 that we started to see the first sort of cracks uh, in the ice. And it started to a large extent here uh, in the U.K. The, uh, the U.K. banks, the Lloyds, the RBSs and the such, uh, Barclays, a little bit more akin to the U.S. style uh, of doing business. And so in 2011 was really for the first time that we saw opportunities to acquire, for the most part, you know, debt situations and over-leveraged uh, capital stacks. 2012 for us was, was very active here in Europe. And we're starting to see like a, a ripple effect. When you drop the pebble uh, in the pond, you can see that the capital has started to make its way from the U.S. over to Europe. For the most part, people recognize, I think, that Europe is severely dislocated and distressed relative to the U.S. And like all situations where there's an arbitrage, capital will find its way. And it's leading first and foremost probably on the debt side, uh, where new pools of capital are being formed here uh, in Europe, uh, again, primarily here in the U.K. But when we look at Europe as contrasted to the U.S., we would say, to use that same bas baseball analogy, it's somewhere between the second and third inning. UK probably a little bit further ahead in terms of the healing process, but as you move across to the continent, uh, you still have uh, severe amounts of deleveraging that are needed within the banking system. And as you move down south to the southern region of Europe, you obviously have major distress in Spain, Italy, etc., and still have a long way to go, I think, before those economies and, and those banking systems will be right-sized. In Asia, it's hard, I think, if that's part of the question, sorry, Fiona, in terms of the commentary on Asia or just U.S. and, and Europe? I'll give you two seconds on Asia because we have a presence in six different markets in Asia and each one is, is relatively distinct one from the other. Australia is probably similar to the developed markets here uh, in, in Europe in that you're seeing opportunities and you see the requirement for capital. Uh, but what differentiates markets such as China and India is obviously the growth. We don't see much at all in the way of growth here in Europe, and certainly over the next couple of years, we're not relying on any kind of fundamental rebound uh, in the overall sort of economic situation, certainly within the large uh, developed nations here. By contrast, China is still growing and, and India is still growing. Uh, but the difference between those two is obviously there's been significant uh, withdrawal of, of foreign investment in India. So if you went across to India in 2005, 2006, everybody was developing. And there was a lot of uh, foreign capital coming to those markets. Uh, we, who are not really uh, developers by heart and are more attuned to buying existing real estate, really couldn't find anything to do for almost a period of five years. But with the changes uh, in, the, uh, in the landscape in India more recently, we've seen a significant amount of capital being sucked out of that market. And as a result, you have a number of developers there that are over-levered and overextended and are needing to sell uh, existing assets today. So we've been very active in that market buying existing assets. Uh, Japan has a different environment by virtue of the fact that obviously uh, it's a slow growth environment. So much harder to find growth opportunities, but much better financing. So you can buy at six cap rates and borrow at really low uh, spreads in order to generate those types of returns. So I think all these markets are slightly different uh, as you look at them. Uh, but in broad brush, I would say Europe uh, well behind the U.S. in the healing process. Anthony, thank you. Fiona, th Europe is behind. And also, if we look at the graphic, it's obvious that Spain and Italy are really lagging behind the recovery. Does that mean there are opportunities? Um, yeah, I'd say for us, the main markets for our, for our company has been, you know, Europe has been about 70 to 80 percent of the focus in recent years. We think that continues. We think there's fundamental distress in real estate in Europe. 
Um, there's obviously the polarization between prime or big cities versus secondary, and we'll come to that in the, in the latter part of the conversation here. But um, within, within Europe, you still have banks that are major owners of real estate with very little kind of capital investment that's gone into that real estate over the last few years. So uh, similar to what Anthony was saying, what we've started to see over the last year, especially in the UK and Ireland, which has been a big focus for Candy Wilson, um, is a lot of bank deleveraging leading to sales. A lot of pent-up capital um, chasing European assets. That's simply because a lot of people have found themselves priced out of the US a little bit in the real estate story. So we do think there's, there's more to come. Uh, we were definitely seeing a lot more distress in Spain and Italy. Um, Spain's become a key focus um, for the firm kind of earlier this year. We've, we've spent a lot of time there, um, starting to see a lot of Sareb deleveraging in Spain. So that's, that's, that's looking like it's going to continue for a while. Um, the flip side of that is we're, off, we're finding a lot more competition in Europe because a lot of US players have started to refocus into the, into the European space and it feels um, like it's getting just a tad bit crowded. Fiona, what kind of capital do you think is arriving in Europe? We have a chart with interest rates, but I mean, it must be very linked. Um, yeah, I mean, the kind of capital that, that, that's in Europe today is actually pretty diverse. I mean, it's got a slightly different uh, group of players than what we would have seen earlier. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of hedge funds um, do real estate uh, transactions in Europe, not, not typically... Uh, not typically a player in European real estate. Um, you've got your traditional private equity funds, a lot more prop co's starting to buy assets, in, especially in the UK. Um, the interesting dynamic has been on the debt side, and that's where that interest, that, that interest rate slide is probably a bit more relevant. It's, um, we've seen a lot of lenders pulling out of European real estate financing. Uh, to state the obvious, obviously, CMBS has been <laughs> pretty constrained in Europe uh, relative to how quickly it's picked up in the US. But even the traditional lenders, like the bank lenders, have pulled out significantly. And that's given rise to a different type of lender in the US. And to go to Jonathan's point, Starwood's um, a financier today, a senior debt fund. Uh, and there's a few more of those opening up. A lot of kind of private capital moving into mezzanine lending. Um, so that's the kind of new flavor of players that has come into to the European lending side. Well, I think it's worth adding that I think certainly during the first quarter or second quarter of this year, the number of American organizations, both the banks and the, uh, the non-traditional lenders, have searched for yield in, in the UK marketplace. And uh, I think for income-based products, that has made the environment very competitive. And you're seeing spreads now, which are down below 200 basis points, and you begin to start to think that maybe the lenders are going too far again. I think there is, whilst the, uh, the loan-to-value levels are, uh, are, are more moderate than they were historically, it's surprising to see spreads come down as quickly as they've done. Um, but I think, I think that is for a certain type of product within a certain area. So if you're within London and you have income, I think you're okay. If you go outside London, it's far more challenging. And if you want to do some development, it's equally as challenging. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more. We've done, most of what we've done in the UK has been kind of secondary assets. So we've, we've looked for yields a lot more outside of London, simply to Jonathan's point, London's, London's crowded, both on the equity side as well as, uh, as, well as for lenders. Um, and six months ago, if we were to look for financing uh, from traditional or non-traditional lenders in secondary markets, that would have been really hard. That market's moved now slowly, but has a lot more to go. So, you know, th there's, a, there's definite polarization between key core cities and, and kind of everything outside the M25. And David, this is one of the points that you were also making, that is that there's a huge increase and a huge shift into non-bank funding debt. Yeah, so if I was to look at, um, as, a, as a law firm, what's kind of on my desk right now, I reckon predominantly it is going to be um, capital structures for, for debt investment. And to Fiona's point, um, the reality is that there's only a certain suite of, of lenders who are going to sit there and play with capital, with income-rich properties like Harrow and Tower and the like. The real juice in those lending deals comes in the sort of secondary non-core markets. And, you know, a bunch of the, the capital raising projects we've got right now are focused on smaller ticket, secondary loans, um, you know, prime secondary, so not sort of really down in the dumps where you can effectively diversify geographically, you can diversify by sector, 
you can go in and really sweat the returns and get you know a proper spread out of what you're you're putting in um, and you know a bunch of the the sort of the, the real estate debt funds that we're raising now have that strategy and you know are getting traction in the investor market frankly where you where you start to come a little bit unstuck is that you know unlike in the US where you could sit there and, and non-bank lenders could sort of raise capital across the, the geography of the US in Europe it's a little bit more dislocated because you know, in terms of the regulatory regime, um, whilst in the UK to go off and, and, and lend money into the commercial sector is, is unregulated by, by and large. Once you start to get to other European jurisdictions, you start to, to, to run into some pretty, pretty strong headwinds on the regulatory environment. France is difficult, Italy has its issues. So there's no kind of joined up solution and one's ability to de deploy capital in the lending space across Europe is going to be choppy. David, will Fed tapering have an impact on that? Will? Fed tapering. Uh, t to an extent. I mean, the reality is that Fed tapering in the, in the US is just going to have an impact on, on interest rates and spreads. The extent to which that impacts uh, in Europe, um, whether it be the UK or Euroland, I think is, is yet to be seen, certainly across my desk. Fiona may have a different view. I, I was just going to comment, you know, we over the last um, five years have had to create 30 new relationships uh, on the lending side because all of the conventional lenders to a large extent are not active today, you know, making loans. You're starting to see them taking baby steps back into the markets. Uh, in some cases, not able to make full commitments on loans, but wanting to participate in syndicated structures and, and, and prove to their own credit committees that there is a market for selling the loans sort of out the back door. Um, the other thing I think is there's clearly also a, um, a polarization in terms of sponsorship. Um, and for all these reasons that the panel is discussing here, uh, I think that this is really the opportunity for investing in Europe. The reality is that because there is a severe lack of financing, it's ultimately forcing asset prices down. And, and, and the reason to a large extent you can buy shopping centers in parts of the world where you can't finance them for eight or nine caps is simply because the financing is, is horrible. And, and even folks like ourselves, who generally deem to be decent sponsors, we're having to drag folks from the US uh, investment banks from the U.S. to finance us in those markets, and they're lending us 55% at 500 over, which is an egregious rate for that type of loan when you're buying the asset at sort of 40% off its prior price, and they're lending it to you at 50% of your purchase price. So like any arbitrage situation, the capital sort of ultimately find its way back into these, into these areas. It's just too rich a return. Uh, but for the moment, it provides that opportunity for us to acquire assets at, at more attractive pricing. We, like, like Jonathan, uh, are seeing here in the UK, literally in the last six to nine months, we're seeing spreads tighten quite dramatically from when we refinanced assets uh, at the start of this year to where we're out in the market today trying to get acquisition financing on our mo most recent acquisitions. Spreads have tightened almost, I would say, 100 plus basis points in the space of maybe seven or eight months. So there is substantial new pools of capital that are coming over here for all the reasons that because of property rights and transparency, they like operating in the UK. It's a lot more challenging and difficult once you move over to the continent. It's more opaque. Information's not there. Creditor rights are not as good. And so it'll take, I think, a lot more time to ultimately find its way across, uh, outside of perhaps Germany where there is capital and the Nordics. Uh, but that, you know, I think is inevitably what's going to happen over the next couple of years uh, instead of Europe sort of recovering by virtue of you know, upward growth in, in, in the economies. I think the capital will find its way back into the real estate industry on the debt side, and that will help, uh, I think, inflate prices. Uh, I think on the interest rate side, it'll stay uh, flatter a lot longer here in Europe than in the US. But, but the, I think the reality is that what we're seeing amongst all of us is a reflection of the underlying economies and, and the performance of the underlying economies. And that's both on a regional basis in the UK and within Europe. So the reason there's no activity in southern, in southern Europe, be it in Spain and Italy, is the, well, certainly within Spain there is no recovery on at the moment. People are waiting to see whether it has bottomed out or whether it's going to go any further. And until that point in time, um, you know, people don't know whether 8 or 9% cap rates are right or whether or not that's still overpriced. In terms of the UK, I think the position is the same. Fiona's right, there's baby steps into the provinces. But ultimately, we're seeing a strong London economy and we're seeing a suspect or weak in, um, recovery in the rest of the country, if any. And, uh, you know, that then becomes a political question as much as anything within the UK. 
about how much the politicians allow London to carry on its growth or how much it wants it subdued compared to the rest of the country because we end up in a two-tiered economy. And you could actually read the whole mansion tax debate in that respect because I don't know, I think it was Knight Frank recently who put out a, an analysis by constituency in the UK of where the mansion tax affected. And I think it's some percentage high in the 90% of two million pound houses which are within the M25 and predominantly actually within London. So I think you've got the whole issue where the banks, unsurprisingly, having been burnt, are following economic recovery. So where there is economic recovery within capital cities, they're following it, and they're following it big time. Elsewhere, they're taking baby steps. I think it's economic recovery and it's the flow of capital. I mean, there certainly is a, a lot of capital coming to London. Uh, London is the number one global port for, for capital because for FERPTA in the U.S., it makes it uh, uneconomic for most foreign investors to want to invest in New York, for instance. And so this is where people want to be for all, for all the same reasons, the transparency, the familiarity, the property rights, and the such. So for these types of assets that we're sitting in today, core stable assets, there seems to be an infinite appetite for these assets. And on a relative basis, if you're looking at putting your capital into fixed income investments versus getting a four plus percent yield with growth, with safety, this still looks pretty attractive. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think we've still got a lot more of this to, to come out, and I think real estate definitely represents, um, well, we do more commercial than we do residential, but definitely represents a, a great reason to allocate capital into this sector. Um, to talk about the London versus non-London debate, I mean, we've been really active over the last few years, whether it's buying non-performing loans, which is a big part of our business, or just buying direct real estate. And just to give you a flavor of kind of where we've looked, um, we've bought very little or next to nothing in London. Most of our UK strategy has been regional, because um, that's where we're really seeing those asset prices depressed. That's where we're seeing the lack of financing, which kind of hurts when you have to put up big equity checks. But on the flip side, it's, it's where you get your good cash and cash yield. It's where you, you know you're underwriting to a really sensible value per square foot and a good basis. Um, Ireland, on the other side, on the other side is, which is which is a big market for um, KW. Most of our activity is core Dublin, um, and that's because Ireland's gone a little bit full cycle. They've they all realised they had a big party. The party's over. We've got to clean up, sell the assets, move on. Banks can't own them forever, and we've started to see a lot of that come out over the last year or two years. And um, the focus in, in Ireland has very much been in, in core Dublin, where the kind of property we've been buying and, and the kind of yields you've managed to get with core Dublin still stack up, whereas in, in London, you'd, you'd just never be able to buy um, anything as cheap as that, just because London's always treated a little bit distinctly, whether it's from lenders or capital providers, equity providers, very, very differently to the, to the rest of Europe, really. Thanks, Fiona. David, where do you see the, the best opportunities? I want to show you a graph, which is actually asset allocation. I think f this is on a kind of neutral return, if I get it. Hold on. It's the last one. There it is. Um, wh where do you see the best value? So, um, again, just, sorry, thanks. Just looking at um, you know what we're seeing across, across our tables, the, 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 the the key activity and the core activity for us is, apart from the debt space, is secondary activity in the secondary region. So you're seeing um, you know, a bunch of uh, inward capital, be it from Asia in small, in, in small scale, or the US in a slightly larger scale, um, stepping into some of the regions. Kennedy Wilson's a good example. Um, the reality is there that you know, these institutions would love to take a chunk of central London, just can't, but people who are doing it are running big checks, their whole strategy is long-term. It gums up liquidity of these, these assets. They're not going to be coming back to the market anytime soon. So they're forced to, to effectively gradually trickle out into the regions, and you're seeing that, and we're seeing that um, you know, in quite a large-scale fashion. Um, beyond that, you know, it's just the story for us is, is pretty much about U.S. capital. I mean, it's no surprise we're a U.S. law firm, and you know, we sit there and, and, and corral a lot of U.S. capital into, into the U.K. and Europe. And, um, you know, the Americans are coming, people said, and it's true. I think that's a function of, you know, the opportunistic uh, profile of many of the, of the U.S. Uh, capital sources. You know, we've moved from distressed in many of the European regions to opportunistic. They're used to hunting up the risk curve. They're doing that, and they're, and they're starting to come in, in some strength and volume. 
I would say, you know, from our perspective, on a, from a macro uh, uh, level, we're seeing better opportunities in Europe and Asia and, and fewer opportunities in the U.S. Um, in Europe itself, you know, we're a little bit hamstrung by virtue of the size of our funds that we generally are targeting larger investment opportunities, which means we generally want to be in the larger cities, the more liquid cities, as we have to consider uh, the exits on our investments. Um, you know, the primary versus secondary play we've looked at a number of times. We haven't so far uh, really jumped in in any large way. What instead we've tried to do, and, and really for the first time in, in a number of years we've had the opportunity to do, is to try to buy, you know, quality assets uh, in the primary markets, London, Paris, etc. But we're acquiring them either through, through the debt to get to the asset or we're acquiring assets that have near-term vacancy, legal ownership issues, uh, and ultimately, you know, trying to fix those issues and, and ultimately develop what is really core and stable assets uh, back into the market because there is a significant amount of core capital looking for the stable assets in these primary markets. So certainly in, in London and Paris, the two major cities, that's been in general uh, our investment approach. Uh, as we've moved across into, you know, the rest of Europe, uh, we've been very active in the logistics space, uh, driven in part again by lack of liquidity in some cases in terms of financing individual single tenant assets. But if you can acquire with cash five, six, or seven of these, you can generally then get those financed. You offer a more diversified portfolio. And we've built a platform today now of a little over 30 million square feet um, in modern logistics in, in five different regions uh, across Europe. And we're going to look to expand that as well. Uh, we've also been fairly active in the retail space uh, across Europe. Uh, and I think there'll be some more opportunities in retail there's certainly the question of, um, of the impact of internet um, on that space, and you've got to be obviously careful in terms of which retail assets you're focused on. Uh, but we're seeing very good opportunity in Europe, and we're seeing very good opportunity in Asia right now. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I, I would add to that is I think that uh, one of the lessons in the last maybe 10 years, in, in addition to uh, the financial meltdown, was the fact that I'm not sure everybody uh, assessed jurisdictional risk when they were mm. running in and out of various countries. And I, I did hear somebody at, at the Global Milking Conference in April who was a significant global investor say that he decided that a 10 to 12 percent return in his home country was actually worth more than a 25 percent potential return mm. in an environment he didn't understand. And for me, that speaks large for a lot of investors in the last five to ten years. I think people have discounted uh, uh, too uh, aggressively jurisdictional risks, uh, not understanding the way in which jurisdictions operate, um, and as a result have got caught in those jurisdictions. So I think in terms of looking at the macro position, it's very easy to say, well, actually, I'd rather move my capital around like it's on a chessboard. I think my preference is be to stick within jurisdictions which you understand, which you know, which you've lived in or have got partners you totally trust in that have lived in. But Jonathan, I guess as yields tighten, will it not push investors to take on more risk? Well, that's, that's inevitably the way that people, that people operate. I, th I think that what's happened in terms of real estate is that, that people contracted their exposure to real estate very aggressively in 2007, 8 and 9. And I think one of the reasons why we've seen such an uptick in, in, in real estate has been that people have begun to re-expose themselves to those marketplaces. And I think once they've saturated the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the markets that we've been talking about, you know, the capitals and, and the stronger markets, then the market then capital, as Anthony says, will flow out into the regions and flow out into other areas as people seek yield. That doesn't mean to say they'll get it. And uh, I think that's the, that's the cautionary tale. I think the jurisdictional point is really, really valid. Um, unfortunately, all our markets have short memories. Um, we'll all, I'm sure, everyone will find their ways back to places where they, where they got burnt. But it's a really valid point. I mean, we buy a lot of NPLs that the banks are selling. And, you know, when you're doing that in Ireland and you're doing that in the UK, it's a completely different um, investment case. You've got a mortgage, you appoint a receiver, you sell the asset, off you go. You know, you have a mortgage in Italy, you have a mortgage in Spain, you have a mortgage in France, for that matter, and it's a completely different story. It's, it's who you know, um, how easy is it to enforce, how, can you appoint a receiver, uh, how well is the borrower plugged into the courts, uh, do you need the courts? I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely been one of the few reasons why, you know, it's definitely one of the reasons why you do see 
the UK as being so much easier to start with for foreign capital because you kind of know your way around. You, if you don't know your way around, you'll at least find three people who will give you the same answer. Um, so you kind of make up your mind about, okay, that must be the way around, um, as opposed to when you're in jurisdictions where you, know, you, you think you know how it's supposed to work, but there's so little practice behind the theory, and whatever practice there is, is you know, someone telling you a story about, oh, my loan defaulted two years ago, I'm still in court, and hopefully we'll get out of it someday. Um, well, Spain is a very good example for that. I mean, for those who don't operate in Spain on a daily basis, and they think that real estate is cheap and they can enforce through the administration or insolvency process in Spain, well, uh, caveat emptor, let, let the buyer beware. I mean, we've got a situation in Spain. We've actually been operating as Heron in Spain for over 30 years, and uh, we've got leisure centres. You can have, um, in, unsurprisingly, where they're consumer-facing businesses, one or two of them have some troubles. And to get rid of them, even when they're in liquidation, is not so easy. Mm -hmm. It can take a long time. You file for protection in Spain, the banks get stuck, you don't get interest for 18 months, maybe sometimes two years. So it is exceedingly important that when one's looking for these returns, that one totally understands uh, the, uh, the environment. And, and from what I've seen in Spain, whenever you think something can go wrong, invariably it does. Mm -hmm. And whenever you think a court can hold you up, invariably it does. And it doesn't always make the most logical decision. And that's not to criticize Spain as a country. Um, because you know we have a great assets there and actually a very good business, but you've really got to understand the jurisdictions in which you operate. Uh, yeah, and I think that that's what's pretty instrumental, I think, and it's definitely been our investment mantra at um, Candy Wilson, is you need to have a local team that gets it if you're going to go into that space. And you know we started out in Europe with a 14-member investment management team that we bought from a financial institution, they knew Ireland, they knew the UK, they knew it inside out, they'd been doing business there for the, for the last 30 years. Um, we're looking to do the same in Spain. Uh, we've done that in the UK. We've got people who've um, effectively done debt all their lives in Europe. We've got people who've done equity all their lives in Europe. And I think having, having a team on the ground that's, that knows their way around and knows what to look out for is, is crucial when it comes to, to real estate investments. David and Anthony, I'm just going to ask you two quick comments and then we're going to take questions from the floor. What has changed? What's the main thing that's changed from investing in real estate pre-crisis to now? Um, I guess a bunch of things, really. Um, investing in real estate pre-crisis, you know, we've talked about some of them already. You know, people were kind of eyes, eyes shut in terms of some of the risks that were involved in the jurisdictions they went into. Um, I think... The way in which capital structures and capital has been put together to invest has, has changed. Um, you know, you wind the film back to 2000 and 2008 when I guess, you know, global allocation into commingled funds was, I don't know, north of $100 billion. Uh, you look at the last two years, it's, you know, probably two fifths of that. Um, so the manner in which capital has put itself together to, to invest has changed fundamentally, shifted more towards direct investment, uh, club deals, separate accounts, joint ventures. So the control features for the capital have, has come back much more to the fore. Um, and people wanting to basically, you know, do away with the fees they're getting, they're getting burned with and, and, and know pretty much, you know, what they're going to go into and, and control their exit. Um, you know, to me, those are sort of two of the key legal pieces that we see in terms of the change and the shift. I think from our perspective, when we look back in, at, at investing in the last sort of uh, uh, part of the cycle, 2006, 2007, which was a very tough time to be investing, and what are some of the lessons that we learned from, from doing that? You know, at that period in time, as you all are aware, you know, yields were tight once more, and, you know, we were in search of ways to achieve the, the overall returns that we were targeting. And so what we tended to do was to drift away from the, the city center assets into more of the suburban assets, the more high yielding assets, more of the operationally intensive assets like hotels or healthcare in an attempt to create a, additional yield. And the reality is um, those assets did not perform as well uh, and certainly post-crisis did not recover to any great extent. So. You know, would we have been better off buying lower yielding city center assets? Um, probably at the end of the day. And the second point, which we were always very diligent on and probably more um, successful in the US was on the financing of our assets and being very careful on the covenants 
uh, and the headroom and the flexibility in those capital structures. Um, in Europe, we were less so, and in some respects, it was just the banking system itself that imposed more strict covenants, which wasn't a bad thing from a lending perspective. But when it became problematic and we were willing to discuss with the banks modifications and amendments or willing to even finance, you know, pay downs of that debt, uh, it was very hard to do so with the banks in, uh, in Europe. We were much more successful dealing with the U.S. banks um, in terms of modifying, extending, buying in, and ultimately uh, getting to the other side. So we're very focused on, on our capital structures today and, and making sure that we have the appropriate covenants and headrooms because the world can always change on you. There are exogenous events that can happen that will require you to obviously come back to the table if necessary because you aren't able to meet your covenants. We want to have that flexibility. We want to limit core protection as much as possible to the extent that we want to sell assets. And we're debating and continue to debate the, the primary versus secondary um, thesis given our uh, recent experience in 06 and 07. Thank you very much. Do I have any questions from the floor? And if you do have a question, please tell us where you're from and also who the question is to. Yes. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I'm Kelly Hampal from Taconic. And um, I'd like to ask a question, Anthony, if I, if I may. Uh, I thought you raised some very interesting points with respect to the, the Japanese market uh, having a fairly attractive, <clears throat> excuse me if I, if I got this right, having fairly attractive cap rates uh, with aggressive funding, but not really much of a view in terms of growth. Correct. I'm curious to see if you think the actions taken by Abe and the Bank of Japan to try to encourage inflation would change that view, and whether or not you, you see some optionality in that market, or if it's mostly a, uh, a, a, a j just a yield play for you. Thanks. Yeah, I think you know the obvious uh, issue with Japan is is the is the population trends and and where the growth is going to come from. Um, yes, there could be some uh, improved sort of inflation in the assets, but our underwriting in general uh, in Japan is very very uh, close to zero uh, in terms of sort of NOI growth or EBITDA growth, uh, and ultimately it's the attempt is to try to set these up with financing that you get a very high cash on cash return, and not really have to rely on on a lot of growth in the interim. Now, if we just bought at market cap rates today wouldn't, and sold at market cap rates in the future, we probably wouldn't be able to get our returns, or certainly wouldn't. So we have to find ways to create a basis that is a little better than market, uh, with very little growth in the future, and then ultimately assume we can sell at a, at a market cap rate. Any other question? Any other question? Jonathan, is London in a bubble? I would say potentially yes. I think that um, what we've seen over the course of the last five years, um, I'm talking primarily here from a residential perspective initially, is a phenomenal amount of um, development of uh, residential stock, of conversion of existing office stock into residential stock. And I think just like I talked at the beginning in relation to this Heron Tower about location and quality, I think that where you've got the right location and the right quality, you, 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 you'll avoid that bubble. I think what, what, what surprises me today, and, and, and we've got um, two schemes, or three schemes, one's just completed in the Barbican, we've got two other schemes in the West End, one just off Maribyrn High Street and one down by the river, um, all of which we, of course, believe are in prime 100% location, but we would say that, wouldn't we? Um, I, and, of course, we, you know, we, we do believe it. Um, we, we bought those sites back in 2009, 10, and I think if you equate the site values today or what the site values were then, if you equate what people are talking about on a per square foot basis now compared to then, and if you look at the number of developments that people are talking about whereby they're talking about three and a half, four thousand pounds a foot, I think that there is danger of a bubble. Um, and I think that there's a danger of a number of people being caught short by not having the right developments in the right positions. I think you've also got a secondary issue, which I think is a broader political issue, which is that the vast majority of the developments that are being, uh, com are, are being completed in, 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 I would say, the West End of London primarily, and all the units that are being completed are being bought by, um, by non-UK buyers. Now, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. 
But what we're doing is we're pricing London out of the marketplace for UK workers. And we're not providing enough uh, accommodation around London for people who live and work in London. And we're making a we're creating a, a dynamic whereby people who work and who have normal jobs in London can't afford to live here and therefore can't afford to work here. And so I think that there is a whole number of issues that come out of the issue uh, which you raised. But I think, you know, when we all started probably five, six years ago, you know, a £1,000 a foot sounded quite expensive. Then it became £1,500 a foot. And it's now three and a half to £4,000 a foot in off-pitch, not prime, developments by people who have never developed before and who have never put a brick in the ground or a spade in the ground and so I think there is a concern about um, overheating. The, the only contrary point I'll make and then I'll be quiet <laughs> is that the more turmoil there is in the world which unfortunately does not appear to be uh, uh, slowing down, particularly in the Middle East the more migration there is of foreign capital into the UK. If you look at our development in the Barbican, which actually has not been a, a hotbed for Middle Eastern buyers because the Middle Eastern buyers prefer the West End, but it's been a much stronger for Asian buyers, um, you'll see a huge number, maybe 45 or 50 different nationalities who have bought amongst the 270 apartments that we've, we've sold there. Um, if you look into the West End, you see a huge amount of Middle Eastern money coming in, seeking a home. When the Cyprus affair hit, when the banks were frozen, all the read across from all the analysts was, well, this will be good for residential property prices in London. So maybe we all look, need more turmoil in the world to keep the bubble going. But is there a concern of a bubble? I think the short answer has to be yes. Yeah, I wouldn't. I think it'd be hard to disagree. As, as a... If you're a real estate investor and the way you look at buying assets, I mean, you run your models, you put your inputs in, you look at your IRR, you look at yields. And when you look at London Resi and you put all of that stuff in there, it's so hard to convince yourself to buy because you look at those numbers and you go, no, really? Like 2.5%, 3% if you're lucky? Um, so it, it, it does feel like that. And I think you're right. I mean, if you look at all the analysis that people do and when they think about trying to contain house prices in London, they talk about... Should we, should we get the banks to lend less for resi? And I'm not sure that's the right solution in any way because a lot of these trades, especially for kind of what you would now call off-pitch but still prime-ish London, are cash trades. I mean, there's a lot of these new developments where the lights are off in, in many of the flats because it's where people have liked to park their money. And if you think about buying resi across Europe um, and, you know, everyone thinks of buying a house, it's pretty illiquid. You own a house, then you've got to flip it, it's not, an, it's not a liquid investment, it's not something you can move capital in and out of too quickly. But if you really think about how easy and quick it is to buy in London and how easy and quick it is to sell in London, it's not that illiquid. You actually do get stuff done pretty quickly. I mean, I don't know about you, but you can exchange on, on a house in London in what, three weeks, four weeks? Um, you know, completion happens three or four weeks after that. That's pretty quick by most standards when you think about the rest of Europe. So it is an easy place to park money, but just by virtue of being an easy place to trade into, it's probably an easy place to trade out of when, when, when capital shifts back to, to the homes that it, it came from. So you're right. I mean, the turmoil around the world helps prop up the London bubble. It's, it's just the question has to be asked as to what happens when you know, people from Greece and Italy and Spain move money back home. Um, people from Asia start to think, you know, my currency's come down. I, it's suddenly the sterling's starting to become really expensive for me to buy into. And and when that starts to sh that focus starts to shift, um, I, I kind of question whether London Resi stays where it is. It, it's hard to say it will. I, I think I think where the danger it will occur, it, it's not actually at the purchaser side. I think it's at the developer side. I think that people are taking developments without any downside protection, so they're buying off land values which give themselves no slippage in the marketplace. And if you're buying off a, buying a piece of land and developing off a base value of three and a half thousand pounds a foot, you've got nowhere to go. And I think that's been very different. And that's why we haven't acquired anything in, actually in the residential market since 2011, because we don't feel that we've got that downside protection, that fat of profit, to give ourselves slippage in the marketplace. Anthony, David, do, do we have a contrarian view? Do either of you think that we're not in a bubble or that the bubble can be sustained for four or five years? <laughs> 
Um, I mean, it depends on what sector you're in. So, you know, and, and, and London residential, I think people would struggle to disagree that this, there's a bubble. Um, some might say that the residential London bubble may actually grow uh, with some government assistance that is much in the press at the moment and extend beyond that. And, you know, th these are kind of worrying times in the southeast in terms of the residential markets and where they're going. You know, the, the, the house, de the developers have scaled back over the, the recession. They're now finding themselves overwhelmed with, you know, potential product and an, a demand for, for outturn and the extent to which they're just going to be able to sort of capitalize on that is, is moot. Um, so London residential, southeast residential, I can see that bubble continuing. For me, the, the interesting question is, is more on the residential side around, you know, when and if and how we ever get outside of London and the southeast and what the story is within the, region, the regions residentially. And that one, you know, I couldn't call, but frankly, is one to watch, I suspect. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't really disagree with any of the panelists. I, I do think that central London is driven by, on the margin, the instability in the rest of the world today. And uh, if you are of the belief that the world is going to solve its issues and its problems in a relatively short time period, then you should probably be shorting London, central London residential. If you think the world's going to continue to be rather unstable, there is just a strong desire for capital to find a safe haven, and, and this is the best safe haven in the world. Uh, you know, outside of London, uh, it's driven more by fundamental demand. And, and, and to Jonathan's earlier point, you know, the rest of the UK is is doing okay, but not great. And, and as a result, house prices, to a large extent, will reflect supply and demand. But but central London is is living off of more than just fundamentals. Well, on that point, Anthony, I heard U.S. Ambassador Dennis Ross speak last night. As did I. As did you. And he predicted that, we, unfortunately, we're going to be in a period of political turmoil yes. uh, in the world and the Middle East for at least another 10 to 15 years. So on that basis, I think we'll all be okay because we'll have sold the product. Yeah. Self-sustaining bubble. Um, I'm pretty depressed because I'm looking for a place right now. Yes, the gentleman right there. Um, can I just ask what you think about how changes in working practices might impact the property market going forward? So, you know, a lot more homeworking, just, just thinking about whether people need to work in cities. If you can't afford to live in cities, I mean, you can sell a pretty average house in Fulham and move to quite a nice place down the M3. You can sell a big place in Chelsea and have a huge estate. Or if you can't afford a small flat in Dagenham, you could go and live somewhere out, you know, much further out. Do we see the changes in home working changing both the residential market but also the nature of office space? And is that something that you guys are actually thinking about at the moment? Well, I, th I think that, that goes to the point that I was making before about, um, you know, you, 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 th there is a huge demand for employment in, within London, and yet the, the uh, residential requirements don't match it. I think that, I don't think people are seeing the dynamic at this moment in time of people, of businesses moving outside of London for cheaper, for cheaper employment. And, uh, you know, it does happen in part, but it, I don't think there's been a big trend towards, towards that happening. I think there has been a trend around London, and S Stratford is an example of that, of cheaper um, uh, office accommodation being provided, and that must be a way going forward because I'm not sure that people, when you look at the, take the West End as an example, one doesn't need to be spending £100 a foot for uh, very many of the businesses that operate within the West End. No, but if we think about the way that, you know, Amazon has changed the retail market, and, you know, if you, you couldn't have probably imagined that 15 years ago, Home working, why do people actually need to come into London if we've all got, in effect, telepresence or, you know, Skype that is of a real quality? There are some jobs that need to be done in London, but there are a lot of jobs that don't necessarily... And do you th it doesn't uh, you're, sound you're like anybody's right, thinking that you're going to see a big a, picture change. You're right, of course, and there's a dynamic and there's a balance between those. I think what you're finding is that even the most advanced technology companies like to have bases within major cities. If you go up to go down to the 26th floor here, you've got Salesforce, which is one of the growth... US IT vehicles, uh, companies. Now, they have taken a floor here, uh, and they're four floors below us, or I think where we are, but they've issued over 400 passes because they've got flexible working. No one's got their own desk, and they come in, they plug in, and they play. So, of course, there is a change, but I think still major companies, as Amazon and Google have shown um, in, in London, LinkedIn have done the same, Google has done the same, Facebook has done the same. They're all taking major office headquarters within London because they feel it's the right thing to be seen, to, to, to be there. 
Um, do, they, do they require slightly less space? Well, maybe some of them do, but Amazon and Google have taken vast spaces recently within London. So maybe they're answering you. It's, it's, their, business, it's their business needs which they're answering. And ultimately, they want to attract the best capital. They want to attract the best intellectual capital to their business. And, to collect, and I think they feel that to attract the best intellectual capital, they need to be within the major cities. And I think in addition, I, I do think that what these firms are acquiring is less space, more efficient space, X feet per, per employee is getting you know, lower and lower. But I think what they have found is that there's nothing that really replaces human interaction in terms of generating good ideas and generating best products. And as much as having people diversified working out of their homes, it's not the same as getting people around a, a conference table uh, and discussing ideas live. And, and if you look at the layout of their spaces, they do create these types of ad hoc informal meetings consistently to try to create you know, sharing of information, thoughts and ideas between engineers, creative designers and the such. And I don't think you ever will be able to replace that, that human interaction. Yeah, and I think also to, to the same point, Anthony, I think there's an element of London's a bit of a melting pot in terms of the cultural diversity, in terms of the cosmopolitan nature of the workforce in London, that is hard to replicate outside London. If you think about the amount of people who come and work here who are not English, um, you know, the, the, the place that they all come to work in is London and it's very difficult for kind of new generation companies, if you like, to replicate that um, away from, from the city. I think the risk that Jonathan points out to is, is, is pretty real in my mind where if, if the people who live and work in London can't afford to buy because there's, there's, there's outside buyers who are doing cash trades and buying up resi, that is a longer term risk. And it's, it's, a, it's a political point, really. It's a longer term risk as to, is that good for London? Because you're, you're probably going to have to find, you know, we'll find people who try to find solutions of working somewhere else because it's not sustainable to live here. Whether that's buying, whether that's renting. But I, I do think we live in a, in a very unusual city. Uh, it, 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 and you know, if you look at London in the, in the last 18 months, the two fastest growth areas in London have, have been unusual ones. There's the one near the new French school on the other side of Chelsea, and there's the Marylebone district. They're not even the obvious areas. When you go north of that into uh, the St. John's Wood areas, they've also had some of the fastest growth rates in the last 18 months. And what it's doing is it's pushing, you know, the, the overseas capital is pushing Londoners further and further away. And uh, that is a big political issue. Although, of course, if you're Ed Miliband and if you're a developer and you're sitting on land, you'll just take the land away from them and do it yourself. So, uh, but that, that, that's a, just, again, that's another issue. Just quickly to your point, though, I suspect the largest, the biggest impact is not going to be around London per se. I would have thought the biggest impact on smart working or the way in which ch life changes will impact real estate is more, you know, secondary retail. So, you know, that's an obvious one that's going to suffer non-destination retail. And, you know, on the negative side and the positive side, I guess, logistics and distribution, which, you know, clearly going to benefit on the upswing from, um, from people like Amazon, et cetera. So to me, you know, I agree there's less of a likely impact on, on London as an environment, certainly more immediately over time, it'll, I guess it will have an impact, but more immediately in the regions on the secondary and the, uh, and the logistics. I have time for one more question. So I'll ask the last question. Yes, right there. Uh, Diane Sobin from Threadneedle. Uh, since we went through the UK market, uh, for Anthony, for the US market, uh, you've made significant investments in single family homes. Uh, in curious as to what you think about the future growth of institutional ownership of single family home, homes and the viability of a, uh, a rental model or within that sector? Yeah, sure. We've, uh, we've been very active over the last uh, 15 months, um, having acquired um, almost 40,000 homes uh, in the U.S. Um, <coughs> what's ultimately, I think, going to drive the institutional appetite is the creation of a CMBS uh, market um, to finance uh, these for rent portfolios. Uh, right now, we're, in a sense, trying to create that in the U.S. Uh, the banks have been relatively, um, uh, I would say, cautious uh, in their approach. Um, but I think once it can be established that, that there is a CMBS market, you'll get more banks willing to lend against this product type. There still is a lot to prove in terms of how these do perform, what the turnover uh, ratios are, uh, what the RMN expenses are, et cetera. Uh, 
Um, we have the internal debate as to whether these should be in the public markets, whether they should be a permanent for rent uh, a vehicle, or whether the, uh, you know, more along the lines of what we've uh, made the bet on, which is that ultimately we were buying these assets at steep discounts, we'll rent them in the interim, and then ultimately we'll sell these assets, uh, you know, uh, at the end of our hold period. There are others like Wayne Hughes, um, who believes that the U.S. rental market is going to move forever, f at least, so the housing market is going to move forever from sort of a 64% homeownership rate to somewhere in the 50s, and there will be a permanent pool of renters uh, wanting to, uh, to rent these homes. And it's ultimately going to be yield play, and he asked the question as to why wouldn't these trade anywhere uh, away from where the multifamily REITs uh, trade today. So far in the U.S., it's been a little bit of a tepid response to those that have gone public. Um, we're watching it closely uh, to see what happens and what transpires. Um, I think there always was a permanent uh, rental base uh, of single-family renters. We just didn't really know about it in the U.S. until a lot more research was done and, and folks like ourselves got, got more interested in that sector. Um, and I think it will exist, but clearly the challenges of managing these portfolios uh, are a lot greater than managing multifamily portfolios. And um, we've yet to find out really the long-term trends of, uh, of, of renters and tenants uh, in these portfolios. So. I think the jury's still out as to whether it has a permanent place in the institutional market. Guys, thank you so much. That's unfortunately all we have time for, so I'd like to thank our panelists. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. David, Fiona, Jonathan, and Anthony, thank you so much. <laughs>